Tonight we'll be in the 18th lesson in Genesis. This will be the last of the first difficult text to teach. <coughs> Not because the meaning is difficult, you understand, because uh, because the nature of the text is the things that are made known in the text concerning God and his purpose that are the accent. This is the generations of Seth, from Genesis 11, verses 10 through 32. Now, there's a lot of things we're going to see here tonight. These are the generations of Shem. Shem was a hundred years old and begat our facts add two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he begat our facts add 500 years and begat sons and daughters. And our facts add lived five and 30 years and begat Selah. And our facts add lived after he begat Selah 403 years and begat sons and daughters. And Selah lived 30 years and begat Eber. And Selah lived after he begat Eber 403 years and begat sons and daughters. And Eber lived four and 30 years and begat Peleg. And Eber lived after he begat Peleg 430 years and begat sons and daughters. Peleg lived 30 years and begat Ru. And Peleg... Peleg lived after he begat Ru 209 years and begat sons and daughters. And Ru lived two and thirty years and begat Sarug. And Ru lived after he begat Sarug 207 years and begat sons and daughters. And Sarug lived thirty years and begat Nahor. And Sarug lived after he begat Nahor 200 years and begat sons and daughters. And Nahor lived nine and twenty years and begat Terah. And Nahor lived after he begat Terah a hundred and nineteen years and begat sons and daughters. And Terah lived twenty years and begat, lived seventy years and begat Abraham, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran begat Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity, in Ur of the Chaldees. And Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarah, Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran the father of Milcah and the father of Iskar, Iska. But Sarah was, Sarah was barren. She had no child. And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan, and they came unto Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now to the average person, those texts don't mean anything. You'll find relatively few professing Christians that have any idea at all about what we just read about. Before the people of God, when you talk about people like Abram, you know, boy, per, you perk up, this is a key person. But this is, I want to be quite frank about this. 
In the modern church, Abraham is not a key person. That pretty much tells you the story, what kind of thing we're dealing with here. And anyone who says Abram or Abraham is a key person, ask the average Christian what they know about him. They might know about him being challenged to offer up Isaac, maybe a couple of things, but they'll know very little about Abraham. Because we've got a breed of Christianity on our hands that Abraham is incidental. But see, in God's economy, this is not the case at all. Now we're seeing here that being exposed to God, how God works. Remember, these are all these are not history records. These are records of how God worked. If they were history records, they're very spotty. <laughs> very little. When you, when you have a period of 2,000 years covered by 11 chapters of the Bible, I mean, this case, you ought to be able to just figure out that this is not just like history. This is God's working, how he worked, very deliberately. Things on earth may occur that look like they have great weight, which they did in this time period. I made some time back <coughs> a list of things that were famous in the world that occurred during the time periods that great events of Scripture happened. They're never mentioned in Scripture at all. Why? Because they're great in the eyes of God, but they're, they're not great in God's eyes at all. There's no apparent intellectual connection between Genesis 11.9 and Genesis 11.10. How are you going to bridge that? How are you going to bridge that with your intellect from Genesis 11.9 to Genesis 11.10? Here's how it reads. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the people, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. These are the generations of Shem. So what kind of bridge is there exactly? Well, there isn't any. The bridge is a bridge of purpose. It's not a bridge of history. There's no easy, we have no idea what kind of time we're talking about. That's incidental. Amen. Now we're going to comment on what God did. First he ta told you what man did. Now I'm going to tell you what God did. There's a divine logic here. <coughs> while, the plan, <coughs> while the plans of men as illustrated in the Tower of Babel, in the city of Babylon, can suddenly be aborted. The plans of God cannot. Amen. Right, that's, the, that's the thing we're going to see here, that what man does, it can just today be here today, gone tomorrow, but that's what God's doing. That's not the way. So that's why people that teach like the 70 A.D. doctrine, if you're not familiar with it, the 70 A.D. doctrine says in 70 A.D. when Jerusalem was destroyed, the Jews were, Jews were cut off. And they're just extinct. And there's no way to identify them now. Well, these aren't just a bunch of liberals that teach this. This is taught in this town, right here in this town. This is taught in virtually every Bible college in the land. In other words, what God did was cut short. Now, what I'm saying is, nothing God does is cut short unless it's cut short in righteousness. That's the only way it's cut short. See, so it's just a thing to see in this passage. Now, Jesus, see, the, in other words, God's work is progressing, and, and there may be what appears bumps in the road, but it doesn't slow the slow the what God's doing down, it doesn't stop it, it just keeps, keeps going. You may remember when some prophets told Paul when he's on his way to Rome, 
The bonds and imprisonments awaited him in Rome. The Jews would deliver him to the Gentiles and so forth. They interpreted that to mean he shouldn't go. But Paul knew, no, 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 that's not that. God's just telling me what's going to happen when I do go. Uh -huh. This isn't, the, this isn't the, uh -huh. because this is going to happen, I shouldn't go. When they tried to convince Paul, these are prophets now, we're talking about prophets. But the, God didn't tell the prophets to tell Paul not to go. See, that's where they took that they took the thing too far. God told them that this, you're going to be have bonds and imprisonment. Well, they thought they saw they couldn't turn Paul's mind. So, being godly people, they responded to Acts 21:18, "The will of the Lord be done." And I insist that it was. Amen. That's exactly what happened. The will of the Lord be done. Now see, again, we've got a breed of Christianity that's being embraced by people that the will of the Lord is not considered this way. It's the will of the Lord for me. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, the will of the Lord not, is not narrowed down that fine. You really aren't that important. Now Jesus led the way in this thinking. He led the way. When he was faced with something... It was very difficult because it involved the weight of the, and responsibility for the sins of the world. He asked the Father if there's some other way, you know, so that I, so I don't have to drink this cup of defilement and cursing and being cut off and this sort of thing. And he saw it was no, there was no other way. There was no other option if men were going to be saved. Amen. He said, nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. Amen. So this is kind of the, the bottom line in all of God's dealings. As I say, this is not the way people today think, but this is the way it is, notwithstanding the psalmist, let's hear him, he had the mind, he had a mind that was more precise in thinking than his peers. He said this in Psalm, 19, uh, pro, uh, Psalm 33, 10. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the people of no effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. It's a comparison now. But I'm calling on you to believe this. See, this is really the case. <coughs> Solomon said, There are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel, that will stand. Amen. Isaiah said, Of men who take counsel, but not of me, who devise plans, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. See, when somebody plans something that's not in God's plan, well, that's sin. Amen. Through Isaiah, the Lord said, I say you speak of having plans and power for war, but they are mere words. Now in whom do you trust that you rebel against me? I'm convinced God would speak this way. If God, if God talked audibly to some people, he would say something like this, what are you planning to do that for? How dare you move against me? Do you really think, do you really think my purpose is going to change because of your fickled will? This is what he's saying. Yeah, there's a, ultimately, if you boil it down, there's only really two prevailing mindsets, and that's Satan's. He's trying to get you to think of yourself and to exalt yourself. Yeah. And then there's Christ who says, take up your cross, lay down your life, yeah. and follow me. There's only the really two original ways of thinking that are yeah. available to, to men. Yes. And then you could... It's possible that Satan is really not original either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
And on a definite sense, whatever man plans is destined to pass away. Yeah. Doesn't make a difference whether it's a, it's a tower project or what. Whatever man plans to pass away. Now the account of attempting to make the Tower of Babel should compel us to carefully evaluate what we do. There's no pattern you can give people to do this, but it must be done. These are the generations of Shem. Now I'm going to make a statement here and develop it very briefly concerning God's election and divine selection. I'm going to make the point that for God's purpose to be fulfilled, there has to be predestination. I'm going to say that God can't save you without predestination and election. That's the point I'm going to make. Actually, divine election is necessary because God has told you ahead of time what he's going to do. Now, if this is true, God tells you ahead of time what he's going to do, do you think God's going to announce what he's going to do and then turn this over to the will of man? Does, any, does anyone think they can substantiate this? I defy the world or whoever hears this. I, def, I challenge you. Do you really think that God could determine a purpose and then turn it over to man and his will? Well, you say, well, God will override his will. Well, there's no difference between overriding the will and predestination. There isn't any difference between the two. It's the same thing. Nothing is commenced that God starts that the outcome is not de determined before it's commenced. <clears throat> now, with man, however, projects are largely experiments. But God doesn't experiment. <laughs> he tells you what he's going to do. I'm, right off the bat, I'm going to bring a seed. This woman's going to bring a seed through the woman, which itself is miraculous. Because the seed comes from man normally. The seed of the woman is going to bruise the head of the serpent. And the serpent's going to bruise his heel. So he tells right away what's going to happen. It's not going to happen for 4,000 years. 4,000 years are going to pass before this happens. But it's going to happen. Now I insist that if God doesn't predestinate and doesn't elect, then the outcome is in question. And the outcome is in question. If God didn't elect you or predestinate you unto salvation, which the scripture categorically states, you are predestinated unto the adoption of sons and elected unto salvation. If God didn't do that, then you really have no guarantee that this thing will turn out to your good. Because you've already got forces against you that can outwit you and are stronger than you. So you're aligned against forces that are smarter than you. Yeah. Enemy forces I'm talking about. That are smarter than you and more powerful than you. Which negates the fact of will. If, if someone, if the enemy is more powerful than the other person, than what the other person wants, does that make any difference? It can be overthrown. Mm -hmm. But in this case, the one who makes the purpose is more powerful. Yeah. So the necessity of uh, predestination, that is, that is necessary to see. Now, this is seen in a number of things in our text. God, for instance, he, he predestinates the fact that, that certain people are going to be involved. We have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. These are specific prophecies about these men. I give you the text where God specifically prophesied about the involvement of these men. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jesse, and David. Now a lot of people were in between there and sandwiched in there beside these people. 
but Satan couldn't stop Jesse for a root from coming out of Jesse. Amen. And he couldn't stop a seed coming to Abraham, mm -hmm. even though his wife was barren. And Isaac's wife was barren too, and the seed came through her. And Jacob's wife was barren too, and it came through her. And David, nothing could stop the king from coming from David's lineage. God determined this would happen. Now let's look at this more closely. Abraham was one of one of three brothers. Abram, Nahor, and Haran. How come Abram's the one? How exact they all had the same background. It doesn't give it doesn't tell you, but Abraham was spiritually stronger than the other brothers. Doesn't tell you that. Abram was the one. Abraham had eight sons. <laughs> eight sons. Ishmael, Isaac, Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shush. Only Isaac. Yeah. Only Isaac was chosen. Not on the basis of his character, not on the basis of being first, because God chose him. Amen. Jacob, Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Esau was born first, Jacob was the one God chose. And Jacob had 12 sons. He had 12 sons. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. But the Messiah came through Judah, who wasn't the first. Who can make distinctions like this in people? I mean, this seems simple, but it, it does have to be said. Who could make distinctions like this in people? How could something like this just like turn out this way? like a roll of the dice? Yeah. Or how could this be the result of a decision of a man on earth or of a consensus that people voted on? How could this possibly have turned out like this? Though so God says, when he says, these are the generations of Shem, there's been a lot of work, <laughs> been a lot of work in selection and choosing up to this point. Now this is a, you, this way of reckoning, a genealogy, is a unique way of thinking. The world doesn't think this way. <clears throat> Let me cite myself as an example. And I have, I have 10 children, I've had 10 children, and one that we raised. Uh, Pamela, Michelle, Rochelle, Michael, Leah, Mark, Ada, Benjamin, Jonathan, and Eva. Now, if I was to write up a chronology and I just use Michael, <laughs> well, I can tell you from my family there'd be war. <laughs> Nobody reckons a genealogy like this, brethren, but God does. Why does he reckon it this way? It's not by works. It's by choice, yeah. not by works. That's how God reckons it. Shem, we're going to follow the genealogy of Shem. Shem had six sons. Elam, Asher, Arphaxad, Lud, Aram, and then he had unnamed sons and daughters. But he's not going to give you, to the, the generations of Shem, he's not going to mention Elam, Asher, Lud, Aram, or any other sons and daughters. God's giving the genealogy of his son. That's right. Not everybody else's. Amen. Amen. <laughs> now there's a perspective uh, delivered that may will be reflected throughout Scripture. You can state it in two points. First, both people and events are viewed Regard, in regard to their relationship to God's eternal purpose. That's how people are seen is from God's, what God is doing. Not who they are, what God is doing. And second, the choices and preferences of God 
supersede all other considerations. If God says, I choose Abraham, don't think for one moment that he's going to treat innocently some nutcase on earth who criticizes Abraham. If he says, Jacob, have I loved, do you think he's going to pass over someone who preached about the faults of Jacob? If he said, David was a man after my own heart, do you think he's going to pass over people then looking at who he chose and judging them as though he, they weren't chosen? He's going to judge them with the same judgment they judged his chosen ones. Which is not going to be good. Romans chapter 9, verse 11, talking about uh, Jacob and Esau. The explanation for yeah. Jacob being chosen before they were even born, before yeah. they were now, even out of the womb. And he says, The children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, mm -hmm. not of not works, works, but of him that call it. Which means God is not working based on his reaction to men. That's right. Mm -hmm. See, th this is a big issue about are men saved by works or without works or whatever. It's a big, but see, all through Scripture, this thing of not of works is demonstrated. All through Scripture, there are divine choices made that are not of works. And it's very clear that that's not what prompted God to do what he did. So that when we read, by grace you are saved, that not of yourselves is the gift of God that any man should boast, not of works, not of works. This is what he's talking about here. He's defined what he means by this all through Scripture. But men insist on philosophizing about this instead of just believing the record. When the whole world became absorbed with itself, followed its own will, God destroyed it with a flood, but his purpose moved on. When Ham viewed Noah in an uncomely state and allowed his own assessment of the case to be the topic of conversation, Canaan was cursed, but the purpose of God moved on. When the people sought to build a city and a tower that reached up to heaven, they were given a language that confounded them. They were scattered abroad, but this was the whole human race, remember. But the purpose of God moved on. In the genealogy of Adam, Seth was chosen. In the genealogy of Shem, our Faxad was chosen. Both Seth and Shem had a lot more children. The only one of them was chosen. Our text says that Shem begat our Faxad two years after the flood. Now notice how he's, he's, he's using a point of reckoning. Before the flood, the creation was, that's the point. That was the point you started thinking from. After the flood, the flood, you started started with that point. Two years after the flood, he didn't say 1,658 years after creation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Two years after the flood. The actual, it was the conception of the child, the uh, beginning of the child. This means that our Faxad was conceived no less than 15 months after the flood, some, some time, and it was early on. And Seth was 100, which means he was 98 when the flood started. Nothing but a smear stripling back in those days. But the, but the purpose of God, uh, it kept moving forward. Shem being a, a hundred years, a hundred. Now remember, he was born after Noah was 500. Remember? 
which means Noah was about 503 when Shem was born. Now I want to again make our emphasis on this point of reference is the, is the flood. An appointed epoch, like the flood, is a beginning. Whenever there's an epoch, you've got it becomes a reference point to do your thinking. For instance, when Israel was delivered from Egyptian bondage, that was the beginning. The, that was the beginning of their year. Uh -huh. The calendar changed, built around that. When Jesus was born, the calendar changed. <laughs> now you have bef before and after Christ. Calendar change. See, why? It's built around these pivotal points. Mm -hmm. This is how God, which means God is working around mm -hmm. this point. So he insists that men kind of bring their thinking in the sink. So after the flood, you, these people had to think about after the flood. Well, a flood, that, thank God, is there is something at all after the flood. So they had to build their thinking around that. So it is in Christ Jesus. When you're born again, you're a new person. It's not that there's anything wrong with birthdays and all this sort of thing. We don't. But you don't want to get too caught up in it. Because your life really began when you come into Christ. Yeah. Newness of life. You got to learn to reckon on that. Do you know a lot of backsliding happens because people don't think about when they were born again? They don't think about when they came into Christ. Their thinking suddenly is off on some other path. And as a result, they fall away. Now when Cain was, I'm going to show you that the purpose of God now isn't like evident by sight. When Cain was born, Eve thought, I've got a man from the Lord. She, she thought this was the seed. It wasn't. When God promised Abraham at his his seed, he thought he thought he thought first of Eliezer his servant because he was childless, so he thought his chief servant. Then he said, "No, no, no! Out of your own bowels, you're going to bear all that." And he thought Ishmael. Mm -hmm. That's why they that's why they Sarah suggested this plan with Hagar. It wasn't because of lust at all. It, I get so tired of people that don't have any minds commenting on the scripture. It irritates me. They were trying to work out this purpose because God hadn't told Abraham he was going to have the son through Sarah. God didn't tell him. He, he didn't tell him until the year, year before he was born. So he had this promise. 24 years he didn't tell him Sarah's going to be the mother. So how, how would you expect Abraham to think? See, there hadn't been any miracles like we, there hadn't been prophets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there wasn't a scripture. There wasn't major deliverances except Noah. Mm -hmm. How is he going to think like you think yeah. without having any near, where near the information you have? Mm -hmm. It didn't appear as though this is possible. Mm -hmm. But God announced it anyway. And Abraham had faith when he was told. Amen. He didn't even consider his own body or the dead and Sarah's womb. Amen. Japheth was the elder son of Noah. But God chose Shem instead. Jacob and Esau were born. Jacob was born first. Esau was the chosen one. Now all these I give the genealogy, a little chart there about the genealogy, but it was all by divine selection. You can't account for any of those names. Arphaxad, Selah, Sela, Eber, Peleg, Ru, Serug, Nahor, Tira, Abram. You can't account for any of those names apart from the fact that God chose them. Right. That's the only way you can come up with those names. And of course, I have no trouble with this at all. Trust you do not either. Amen. Now you notice how the ages were diminishing. Yeah. We're down into down into the 400s really quick. 
dropped down in the 400s and ended down into the hundreds. Mortality, see, it set in, but it took a while, but mortality set in. Now, a thinking mind reckons on mortality. You must learn to think about your mortality. Holy men have always done this. They thought about the fact that I'm going to die. Almost invariably, sometimes this troubles me, but uh, I'm, I'm not going to make an issue of it, but when someone's told that they're going to die or someone they know is going to die, all of a sudden they almost fall apart. Why should something like this take people by surprise? I told one of my work fellows one time, he said, you're not looking very well today. He said, well, I have a terminal disease, you know. He said, you do? I said, yeah, you do too. <laughs> Why does this take people over? This wasn't the case. Now, if you read the biblical record, this wasn't how it affected the people back then. Why does it affect people that way now? See, this is a serious thing to be thinking about. Here's how some of the ancients thought about death. Abraham said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm e mortal and I'm speaking to the eternal immortal one. How, well, how about that? Jacob said, The days of my years of my pilgrimage are in 130 years, few, few, could be a lot today, few, and evil of the days of my life been. David said, Thy father certainly knoweth that I have found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and he saith, Let not Jonathan, let not Jonathan Know this, lest he be grieved, but truly as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, there is but a step between me and death. There, he, there it is. Mortality. This is how holy men thought. We must all needs die, and there is water spilt upon the ground. Second Samuel 14, 14. David again. Here's Job's assessment. How much less is in them that dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust which are crushed before the moth. Observation of the woman of Tekoa. We must needs die. Then there is water spilled. See, they, this is the way people of God talked. Amen. Here's Isaiah's assessment. See she from man whose breath is in his nostrils. <laughs> Two very narrow passages, as you know. James said, what is your life? Is even a vapor that appeareth for a little while, in, in a little time, then vanisheth away. The priests were not continued, suffered to continue by reason of death, the scripture says. So see, salvation is set within the context of the certainty of death. If you take that out, or you minimize it, or you don't want to talk about it, or you refuse to think about it, you, you don't consider it, and you put it to the back of your mind until it stares you right in the face, and then you think about it. See, you're making a big mistake. Because salvation is in the context of die. Sinners need to be told you're going to die. I used to preach a considerable number of funerals. Oh, I miss it now. But I used to tell the people, a lot of people weren't Christian people at all, so I'd tell them, you're going to die. See this, this is body up here? We're, we're going to be at your funeral. You know, what I have to say is in the context that you're going to die. It's appointed that a man wants to die, and after this is judgment, and the gospel is preached in that context. It's not preached in the context of Jesus can help you with your problems. It's not preached in that context. But he said this, you're just passing through. You're going to leave this world. I must needs go the way of all the earth. Man of God said, Joshua. So the necessity of salvation is being underscored in the book of Genesis. 
Men die, but they don't cease to exist. Amen. See? <laughs> so that once you know this, then there's got to, how do you exactly address this they don't cease to exist? Uh, that now comes salvation into the picture. Yeah. These are the generations of Shem, all testifying about God's choice and about certainty of death. And our fact said, he lived five and thirty years. Remember, Noah lived 500 years, and Shem lived 100 years, and it's now we're down to, he lived 30, 30 years and begat uh, Selah. The children of Shem included Elam, Asher, Arphaxad, Sad, Lud, Aram, but the Messianic seed come from Arphaxad, born two years after the flood. He's also mentioned in the duplication of the chronology in First Chronicles 1. See, the people of Israel had forgot the chronology, so it was restated again when they'd have certain revivals would awaken and they'd have the, they'd restate the chronologies. We don't know a single thing that our facts had did. <laughs> nothing. Nothing at all about him in the, in the sense of the flesh. Nothing at all in which we have right regard him higher than anybody else. There's nothing at all. It's the fact that God chose and made him what he was. Amen. And you've got the wisdom to see it. The fact that God chose you made you what you are too. Amen. You can see it. That's the way it is. Amen. Nothing is known of where he lived, who he married, if he migrated, any of these kind of details we don't know at all. So when the scriptures say that Jesus was a root out of dry ground, this is part of the dry ground. <laughs> this is part of the dry ground. If you were to just, according to the flesh, try and trace genealogy back, the genealogy of Jesus backward, you, you could, there's no way you could figure this out. You couldn't get back like two or three generations, let alone back to Adam. But here the scripture is taking you from Adam right on up. To Christ to show you who he chose. It's a divine manner. And our facts had beget Selah, and we don't know anything about Selah either. He's just mentioned here, and he's just also mentioned in the Chronicles, and he's also mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus in Luke 3. Some points he's called Sheila, say so it's the same person. See, if salvation are through works, such works would have been included in the preparation as well as in the accomplishment. Yeah, right. Got to see, it says salvation is not today you, you went from, from the category of dead in trespassing sins to alive in Christ Jesus. Salvation is not just that point in time. Salvation starts way back there in the garden yeah. of God bringing Messiah through certain lineage. Mm -hmm. That's in salvation too. So if works are down here at the final step, they got to be at the beginning step too. That's right. But they're not, as you know. And uh, Selah, he begat Eber. We, we, we know a little bit more about Eber, not very much. This is the father of the Hebrew nation. Eber. And it tells us in Genesis 10 that in his days the earth was divided. So there's a kind of a something special we know about Eber. I gather that was at the Tower of Babel, which was according to a division God determined way back in Deuteronomy. Remember, he determined, Moses said he set the divisions of the people according to the children, number of the children of Israel. So God made this determination back then. He began to carry it out in the days of Eber. It must have been sometime in his. So he was somehow, if that's the Tower of Babel, and I think it is, this, he was somehow alive at that time. His days, this happened. Must have been something. Shem is cited as being a, a brother of Japheth, who was the elder, not the oldest son. And this, of course, is a pattern throughout scriptures. Seth was Adam's son, but he wasn't the oldest, but he was the one chosen. Shem was 
Shem was the son of Noah, but he, see, the genealogy is reckoned from Seth first, and the genealogy is reckoned from Shem. Neither one were firstborns. Neither one. Our fact said was the oldest, not the oldest son. Isaac wasn't. Jacob wasn't. Judah wasn't. See, and God's working among men. The fulfilling of his purpose is according to the counsel of his own will, not according to the examination of the people Amen. and assessment of the people. The one who sanctified the pre-flood generations was Seth. The one who sanctified the post-flood generations was Shem. Amen. By God's own choice. Now it's critical to think in terms of the source. When God delivers a promise, it is to be understood that he is the one that's going to fulfill it. A promise is not like a, a prophecy. In a sense, it's a prophecy, but see, a promise is a step up from prophecy. It's not there was a prophecy in the latter days, some sort of part from the faith. That's a prophecy. But when it says that when it, the promise of the Messiah comes, that's, that's something that's in stone. There's nothing that can change that. And if nothing can change the entrance of the Messiah, nothing can change the means by which the entrance came. Oh, that's a glorious thing. So, you know, in the end, all, all the saints are going to say in the end, salvation to our God. Then, then it's going to be seen, going to be seen. There have been debate about it and so forth, argue about it. But it's going to be plain then, saying people are going to acknowledge salvation is of the Lord. Yeah. And Peleg, Selah gave birth to Peleg, and Peleg lived, 50, they lived 30 years, and he begat Ru. Now, Peleg, he's, he's another one. He's not mentioned. We don't know very much at all about him. He's mentioned in Genesis 10, he's mentioned in Genesis 11, 1 Chronicles 19, and Luke 3, and that's, that's it. We don't have any idea of things he did, who he married, and we don't know any of that. Why? Because those are things that don't make the difference in people. As far as God's concerned, the difference isn't that you married so-and-so, or that you had so-and-so, or that you did so-and-so. The difference is God chose. Amen. That's the difference. Yeah. Now, it's very important to see this in our day. Today, thing, man's will has been exalted too, too high. Paul didn't preach this way, exalting man's will. He exalted God's purpose. He said, and I, I continue to this day witnessing both to small and great, saying none of the things and those things which the prophets and Moses did say should come. Mm -hmm. Actually, if you were to have to write a dissertation on the lives of the prophets, well, there's some of them why you would, don't have much you could, <laughs> you'd be able to say. It's just that God chose them and God used them. Generation of Peleg. You say, well, that's not much, but what if I said now the generation of Robert Cobb? You know, what we, we didn't boss that, stick it up on the shelf. Well, what about your name being written in the book of life? That's even greater than this. So it's not what's known of you. It's not the important thing. What you did, that's not the important thing. It's whose you are. That's what is the important thing. Peleg gave birth, uh, begat Ru, and Ru lived two and thirty years and begat Sarug. <laughs> Another person, we don't know anything about Ru. We, this is about it. This is all you know about who his father was and who his... Who his son was. That's, that's it. So if we tell someone, tell us about yourself. I'd like to know a little more about you. Tell them about who you are in Christ. Yeah. Don't tell them about the other stuff that some of which you'll be ashamed. Mm -hmm. Tell them about who you are in Christ. Yeah. Now you'll notice, of course, we're working up to 
to a certain person being born. <laughs> and in Sarug, he, he lived 30 years and he begat Nahor. And notice the number of years, how they've been decreasing. Adam was 130 when Seth was born. Seth was 105 when Enos was born. Enos was 90 when Canaan was born. Canaan was 70 when Mahalaleel was born. Mahalaleel was 65 when Jared was born. Jared was 162. Well, Enoch must not have been his first son, but it's a fir but he had to wait 160 years, two years to get a son of Enoch's caliber. And and Enoch begat Methuselah, and he was 65. Methuselah, he he was 187. He begat Lamech. Lamech was 182 and begat Noah. Noah was 500. He begat Japheth, Ham, and Shem. That is, he began begetting them at that time. Our fact set is 35. Whoa, it was 100. Sim was 100 when he be began our facts, but look how, look how it drops. 38. Mm -hmm. Sheila's 30. Eber, 34, and they begat. Peleg, 30, 32, 30, 29. When they begat this, each one of these, if you calculate it out, it was about the first third of their life. If you look through it, it's amazing how it was pretty, pretty close. The third, first third, or somewhere around there. Which means when they begat this promised link to Christ, they were mature, mature people. I gather this was in order that they might pass along the things that had been made known to that time. It's not a marvelous to consider. So this is a divine manner. As the Lord moves into a period of greater illumination and more concentrated working, he'll raise up men who are capable of discerning more. All right, that's what, that's what God does now. Amen. You see it in this, in this genealogy. God's going to do more. He raises up people who can see more. Mm -hmm. See? <laughs> you see that? Amen. This is how God works. Amen. Why? Because he's made his works to be known and to be remembered. Yeah. He just doesn't work to work. And then uh, Serug, he lived 30 years and beget Nahor. Well, again, I think I like this paragraph you have here. If one of you had any comment on that, uh, where you thought that you, you may have be seeing that same kind of pattern. Oh, yeah, amen. <laughs> that in our time today, the fact that there are people springing up here and there that have unusual discernment is telling us Something's coming. Mm -hmm. yeah. Something's coming of an extraordinary nature. Now, I'm not talking about a great curse. I'm talking yeah. about a great blessing of some sort. But God's, going to, God's raising up people who will be able to see it yeah. because you can't say it till you see it. That's right. yeah. And this is all through Scripture. This is this way. Uh -huh. Raised up people. When Jesus was about to be born, he raised up a Simeon and an Anna and a John the Baptist and people like this who could see it. And after he ascended and glory, raised up other people like Paul and so forth, who could see it. This is one of the frailties of academics and professional knowledge, secondhand learning, I call it, is it can't produce people like this. You can have degrees as long as your arm, be totally undiscerning, unthinking. Was able to give testimony. That's right. And raised him up to it. That's just right. Just for that purpose. That's, that's right. So he give testimony. Behold the Lamb of God. Amen. See that this this goes with the great work. If there's a great working, there's got to be a great declaration of the great work. Yeah, right. Which means there has to be discernment. And now Tira is born, who is Abram's father. Right now, this is where this whole thing's been headed. Mm -hmm. yeah. to, to, the, to, the, to the birth of Abram. That's where this has all been headed. <laughs> he tells you where Abram came from. Yeah. See, Abram was a prophet, called him a Syrian. Remember? Mm -hmm. Your father was a Syrian. 
That was a, when he came out of the Chaldees. So he's accounting for it because if you just looked at Abraham according to the flesh, you, you wouldn't get these kind of conclusions you're getting here. At 70 years of age, Tebra begat three sons, just like Noah begat three sons when he's 500. Not, not triplets, that's just what he's saying. He's saying at this, this was when after this, these three sons were born. After he's 70 years old. Quite, quite a difference after Noah was 500 years old. See, it's quite a, quite a difference. The language means that, as I say, at the beginning of these children began at that time. So it seems that Abram was first, but we're not, we're not sure who was first and who was second, so forth. There's not a lot in Scripture about Terah. You'd think there would be like a father of Abram. You'd think that bit ranked pretty high. Not a lot about him. Enough to give us the clue that the generation of the human race is set in pretty fully at that time. Joshua said about Terah, and they entered the promised land. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, that's Nahor, and they served other gods. See, that's, that's about what we know. See, when God assesses your past, he doesn't assess it like men did, do. I did this, I did that, I did the other, got caught up on this, got caught up on that, caught up on the other. This isn't how God assesses your past. You shouldn't either. He assesses it, dead in trespasses and sins, alienated from the life of God. That's how he assesses it. This is how God assesses. They served other gods. He didn't say, and they lived during a very brilliant age, and there was a lot of architecture, a lot of pottery and things that were very advanced, and he didn't mention any of that, even though it is true. So he was the ancestor of the Amalekites, Ishmael, Amalekites, Israelites, Ishmaelites, and Midianites. McClintock and Strong traces that out. You can trace it out in Scripture, too. So there was... There were a lot of nations that came, <laughs> that came from him, just like a lot came from Abraham too. A lot of the Arabic and so forth, Midianites. They came from Ab came from Abraham. Some of the enemies, they were some of his sons, were the ones that begat him. So now at this point, <laughs> the uh, funnel of revelation is narrowed down. He started out with two people. We're going to end up this book with three people. Abraham, Lot, and Sarah. Now it's going to end up with this chapter. We're going to start out again. That's the kingdom principle. That with religious men, restoring is a key point. <clears throat> With God, transforming is the key point. I come from a background where much emphasis is put on restoration, getting back to where we were, getting back. I'm saying that this is not even a valid point. That's why I want to make a few comments. Now, Joshua, there was a revival in Joshua's day. And they circumcised the people who hadn't been circumcised during the wilderness wandering. And so they really didn't make any progress. They just like got back to start. Yeah. Samuel's day, revival broke out and the strange gods were put away. They didn't really make any advance. There wasn't any like new perception of God. It's just they got back to starting line. Elijah's day, remember choose you this day, you will serve, you know, and so forth. If God be God, serve him. If Baal, God, serve him. And the people, they agreed to serve God. Some great renewal, re revival, and renewal. But they just got back to the beginning point. They didn't, they didn't learn anything new. Nothing new comes from restoration. No new insight. You just get back to where you 
start again. The, well, this is my own opinion. You got to start again because you got started, you were skewed somewhere along the line, you got thrown off course. You go back to starting line and determine a straight course this time. During the days of Hezekiah, there was a revival. He removed the idols and opened the house of the Lord and repaired the doors and removed the filth out of the house of God and brought in the priesthood, but nothing new. There was nothing new. This got back to the beginning. Amen. Josiah, during his day, they repaired the breaches of the house of the Lord, renewed the covenant of the people. Nothing new. No fresh in, check the record. No fresh insight, no new prophecies. No. During Asa, same thing. They removed the things associated with idolatry, led Israel in an oath to God. But they just got back to start. Manasseh, after his despotic reign, he finally turned to the Lord, took away the strange gods, all of their altars, repaired the altar of the Lord, and commanded Judah to serve God, and took the idols he put in the temple, he took them out. But nothing new. Nothing new. None of these revivals involve spiritual advance. I want to really hammer that down because I was caught in this, I was caught in this kind of thinking myself. If we could just get back to what the church used to be. Well, if we could, we'd just be starting. That's right, man. <laughs> we'd just be starting. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you do have to start again. That is true. But this time we've got to end up a different place. Amen. When it, Joseph and Mary lost Jesus, mm -hmm. after three days they couldn't find him. They figured he was with the relatives traveling along. And where he wasn't there, they had to go back where they got him. Where they lost him, go back where they lost him. Pick him up and make up this three days journey. <laughs> now, if you've ever had to recover yourself from the snare of the devil, you already know this is what you had to do. You had to go back, start again. The glory of it is you can make a little quicker progress. You don't have to <laughs> make quicker progress. But on these, with each of these new epochs, there was a new. Revelation. Now we're coming up to Abram. They're going to it's new from here on out. Everything's new all the time. In fact, the rest of the Bible is about Abraham and his seed, capital S, and seed, small, low, lower S. Rest of the Bible is about Abraham. If there's some kind of gospel that can't be traced back to Abraham. It's not a real gospel. Uh -huh. yeah, that's right. Not the real thing. The man of the kingdom is. New things, new responsibilities, new insights, new progress. If you're going to make progress, you have to see something you've never seen before. Amen. If you're going to grow up into Christ, you have to understand something you never understood before. Yeah. That's what progress is. Amen. Growing in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. In the divine economy, advance, as I say, is attended by greater revelation. Now, there's certain uh, implications of this. One is that advancement is the point. The point is not get in. The point is grow up into Christ in all things. That's the point. Now, really, not many people are making this point. I understand that. That's why this series that Brother Michael is delivering to us on the fall of Babylon is, is so important. Because we're, not, we're living in a time that this is all, what I've said is just all strange. It's, it's just, uh, this isn't the way people think. You know people that you've known for years that they haven't advanced. You know they haven't advanced. We know they haven't advanced. We've got to think in these terms. Why haven't they advanced? Because they haven't seen why haven't they seen? Because they haven't been looking. Mm -hmm. However nice they may be, that's just, that's just the case. This is why it's of such concern to me 
when I see preachers and teachers running out of gas, oh, I've seen it all my all my life as a preacher. I've seen it, pe people run out of sermons. They, after about six years, they run out. They, run, they literally run out of sermons. And if, if, if you talk to them, they'll tell you this. They have to move. They move on to another church because they just run out of stuff to preach. These people have no business preaching. It's wrong that they should preach. Now that we have a the influence of internet, all kind of Christian people get on internet and they got this ministry and they're going to do this and they're going to do that. A few months pass, maybe a year, fizzles out. They don't have anything more to say. They never should have got on in the first place. They're just cluttering the media. They're cluttering the media with a bunch of nonsense. People that don't have anything to say should sit down and be quiet. Not speak till they have something to say. That's why I, have a, I take a great delight in the, so many of our fellows who have something to say. I go over these quotes every week, you know, and can't put anywhere near all of them, about 10% of them in the bulletin. But it blesses my soul to read these things. These are things that, these are things that a lot of leaders can't say. They don't know. They don't understand it. But people have something to say that tells you they've been growing. Amen. They've been advancing. The implication of this text is wherever there's a person identified with the kingdom of God is the person who's entered it. You should be born again. You cannot enter, enter the kingdom. That's why these things are so important, because a lack of life indicates a lack of interest. In, entrance. Now, he throws a little curve at us here. He says, Haran beget Lot, grandson. Well, we didn't, didn't have any grandsons the rest of the, all the rest of the lineage. There wasn't anything like this. Yeah. Closest thing to it was when the Lord through Noah cursed Canaan, who was the son of Ham. That's the closest thing you got to it. But here, he throws in a grandson, Lot. Why, why does he bring him in? The reason is that Lot's going to play an important role in the life of Abraham. And Lot's going to give us an example of a man who was vexed every day with the filthy conversation of the wicked, which there aren't that many men like that in the Bible. Search and see. In other words, he was, he was in an especially ungodly place. Not many of uh, God's people were in this situation. But he's going to provide us a proper reaction to that kind of an environment. Here he is in, in Genesis 11. He's introduced. And Peter refers you back to him in 2 Peter. Tells you about him. And some people criticize Lot. He was just a compromiser. He wanted the stuff that it was in Sodom. No, this is not true. That's right. He chose the well-watered plain for his cattle's sake, not because he wanted to live in Sodom. Well, that's right. These non-Bible reading commentators, <laughs> their mouths need to be stopped. So Lot didn't choose it because he preferred the lifestyle of the people in Sodom. He chose it because he had a lot of cattle and he was thinking about the cattle. That's right. You say, well, he should have been thinking about Abraham. Well, that's, that's, I'm just telling you the way he was thinking. He wasn't, he wasn't thinking of indulgence. Mm -hmm. Same kind of thing took place to Noah, cursed the grandson of Ham. You see, he's telling you what God's going to be doing, see. God, this, a person who's cursed becomes a vehicle through whom all the adversity and all this sort of thing comes. See, God doesn't, God uses Paul to persecute the church when he's not in Christ. But when he's in Christ, he didn't use him to persecute the church or chase the church. He didn't use him for that purpose anymore at all. See, bears a lot. Then the first man that, of scripture record that died before his father was Herod. Aaron died before his father, Terah, 
in the land of his nativity, the Ur of the Chaldees. We're not told why, this sort of thing. But he didn't reckon in the workings of God like the other people would. In Nehemiah's day, it, it says that when they came out, the Ur of the Chaldees, Abram came out of it. But in Genesis 15, 7, in the Nehemiah, excuse me, in Nehemiah 3, uh, 9, 7, they confess, Thou art the Lord God who didst choose Abraham and brought us him forth out of Ur of the Chaldees. So here in our record, it says they, it says, it's going to tell us they left. But when you look back on it, the entire part was that God brought them out. <laughs> So even if you did make a choice to follow Christ and you made a decision, I'm going to follow the Lord, when you get on the inside and you look back at it, God brought you out. Amen. Okay. One brother put it this way, Brother Kenny Smith, when these things began to dawn on us, we were both rather young, still in our 20s. And in a matter of election, we had to come to grips with it, you know, and so forth. So here's how Brother Kenny put it. He said, when you come in, you come in, it says, host server will may come. You get inside, you turn around, same door, it says on this side, chosen in him before the foundation of the world. <laughs> That's the things we're seeing in this text. Now, Abram and Nahor took wives. Name of Abram's wife was Sarai. The name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah, and Sarah was barren. So they got married. What does that? Well, that has to do with something's going to happen a lot, lot later. Yeah. Now these men took wives. That is, it, this was their choice, so to speak, denoting some kind of formality. It wasn't like they decided to live together. It wasn't like that. They took wives. Some kind of formality associated with it. Here again is something that the theory of evolution does not offer us. It doesn't, in the origin of the species and accounting for man, it doesn't give us any kind of perspective of marriage. None at all. But the scriptures do. Because the fact of man's creation bears on what was done with him in marriage and so families and so forth. It was Adam who said a man shall leave his father and mother and leave, cleave unto his wife. So that in marriage, if you can receive this, but a man's wife trumps his parents. Yeah. That's the way it is. Tell I don't think that's right. Well, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Amen. That doesn't mean you neglect them. That's not what it means. It means your wife, if you got a choice between the two, wife. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know some men that choose parents. Mm -hmm. Wife. Uh, evolution doesn't give the, this kind of perspective at all, you see. They take wives, and Abram takes Sarai. You know, later when they faced King Abimelech, Abram said that Sarah was his sister. They both had the same mother. That's not spelled out in scripture here. In fact, it, it must have been, if you read the record, Tira must have married again. Because he was uh, 70 when he begat Abram. And when Abram was 75, he was called. So that would have made... Tira about 145. 
years old. So somewhere, but somewhere, it is evident that he married someone else who fathered Sarah, is what I'm saying. It's not spelled out, but the fact that Moses said this and the Holy Spirit didn't edit his remarks pretty well substantiates that this is the case. So by faith we accept this, that when Abraham said she's my, she is my sister, she's a, we both have the same mother, that he was telling the truth. He wasn't, he wasn't lying at all. Otherwise, God would have edited his remark. Now I wanted to give an example of God actually doing this. First is Samson from Judges 14. Samson went down to Timnath, saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines, and he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all thy people? that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. But his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord, that he sought an occasion against the Philistines, for at that time the Philistines had dominion over the Israel. See, so, so that there was a mark they were made that was, it was edited by the Holy Spirit. Here's another one. Mark 9, 5, and 6. Peter answered and said unto Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elias. Here's the editorial remark. For he wished not what to say. So, <laughs> so it wasn't a thought-out remark. It was a knee-jerk response to the transfiguration of Jesus and seeing Moses and Elijah. Here's another nor consider that it was expedient for us that one man die, should die for the nation, for the people, that the whole nation perish not. That's the high priest, Caiaphas. And this he said not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. So see, there's the Holy Spirit. When the remark was made, there wasn't a thorough remark. The Holy Spirit edited it and told you what was intended. Then one more, John 21. Peter, seeing him, John, saith to Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren, that that disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him, He shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? So see, there it gets again, the Holy Spirit is. It is the remarks that the disciples started thinking John wasn't going to die. And he was the last one of the apostles that died. So I don't doubt that, see, there he is. He's still alive, just like Jesus said, still living. So what I'm saying is any remark in Scripture that's inappropriate, the Holy Spirit will edit it and tell you why. So when, when Moses said, she's my mother, the Holy Spirit said, but he didn't, uh, <laughs> that really isn't the way it was. See? So we, we have then that is the way it was. I say this because there's some people make quite an issue out of this. So this will confirm that Sarah never did have the ability to bear children from day one. It isn't that she got old and lost the capability. She never had the capability right. from day one to have children. But God didn't do it then because some people might say, oh, see, she, she did, she did, she's, she's still in the age factor. She did, there's just something happened there that she finally was able to give birth. No, it wasn't, he let her get past age. Mm -hmm. Scripture called them past age. Mm -hmm. Then she had the child, but she never could have it at all by nature. Now, I don't doubt at all that Satan played a role in this, making him barren. Mm -hmm. Lord, give him some leeway to do this. Sarah was barren. Yeah. Rebecca was barren. Rachel was barren. <laughs> and Jesus and Mary was a virgin. Mm -hmm. See, he worked in these, right. these cases. Mm -hmm. Now, God told us that Mary was a virgin, but nobody else would believe that. 
I say, sure. Sure, yeah. He told us about it. Why? Because see, you've come to believe God. So he can divulge this. Th he can divulge these kind of things to you without you fussing and arguing back. But some people aren't like this. Some people hear things like this in the scripture and they argue back. Why? Because their faith is suspect. And Tira took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran his son's son, and Sarah his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with Ham with them from Ur of Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan, and they came unto Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were 105 years, and Tira died. <coughs> They went forth. That's in for, They went forth. God later says he brought them out. <laughs> oh, I love it. See, this teaches you to assess your life. The time when you made this quantum leap, you can say, well, I, boy, I, was able, I was able to see this. And God opened my eyes. See, that you think, that's how you think about it, reason about it. Now, Nahor... He, went, well, he, he kind of drops out of the picture here, Nahor. It mentioned him, but then they, when they left, they didn't apparently take Nahor with them. But Nahor, he played a prominent role. He's mentioned later, Nahor. Here's Genesis 22, 23. After Abram had passed the test of offering up Isaac as a burnt offering, it was told Abraham, saying, Behold, Milcah, she hath also born children unto thy brother, Nahor. Huz his firstborn and Buzz his brother. I just like names like that, Huz and Buzz. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Kemuel, the father of Aram, and Chesed, and Hazah, and Pildash, and Jidlaf, and Bethuel, and Bethuel begat Rebekah. Oh, Rebekah. From Nahor's clan. And Milcah did bear to Nahor, Abram's, Abraham's brother. So here, Nahor, because Rebekah, that's <laughs> that's that's a daughter mm -hmm. of his uh, brother Nahor. And remember in his quest for a wife for Isaac, Abraham sent his servant out, told him not to take her from the heathen and so forth. He said it came to pass before he had done speaking that, behold, Rebekah came out, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher upon her shoulders. He's bringing this, bringing this up. This Nahor, Abraham's brother, bringing, bringing him up. When the servant inquired, inquired who she was, Rebekah said, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, which she bare to Nahor. See, there he is. See how the Bible is, is, makes these mention because these people play a role in the working out of God's purpose. Here it was. And what about Laban? Laban, he said unto them, Know ye Laban, the son of Nahor? So Laban, who was with Jacob and gave Jacob his wives, he was Nahor's son. So here's Nahor surfaces Later on in the book of Genesis, now you see, in all of this, of course, the purpose of God is what's important. Otherwise, there, there's no significance to this aside from God's purpose. So when this group arrived in Haran, they apparently stayed there for a while. How long, we don't know, but it seems as though it was a significant time. And, they, and uh, Tiber died there. We know from Scripture that Abraham amassed a lot of wealth when he was in Haran, it says. He, so he's like Jacob amassed a lot of wealth when he was with Laban. Abraham amassed a lot of wealth in Haran. And it was necessary. He had a lot of servants and so forth because he's going to deliver a lot later on. So the chapter concludes with our attention focused on two men and one woman. Abraham, Lot, Sarah. 
going to narrow down, and there's going to be in the next few chapters, everything's going to kind of revolve around around them. Well, the multitude of people in all the world, we got down here to three. Most amazing. That's God's choices, mm -hmm. God working out a purpose. Now the Holy Spirit has taken great care to outline the arrangements of the lineage leading to the promised Savior. You can very, very carefully. Now Satan succeeded in deceiving the whole world in Noah's day. And Adam fell almost immediately. So I'm showing here that according to the flesh, it was unlikely that God's purpose could ever be fulfilled. Then Adam and Eve, they're, ex they're expelled from the garden, the place of blessing. And in Abel, he's murdered. And Cain is cursed. And the sin of Ham results in another curse. And then there's the rise of Nimrod, the dominancy. The judgment at Shinar and the barrenness of Sarah. Add to this the sparsity of revelation given this, given this whole period of time. About all they knew was a cedar woman had crushed the serpent's head. They knew the statement of Cain, that is, he did, if he did well, they, but two Cain, if he did well, he'd be accepted. That's something that came from God. The vague prophecy that Noah would bring comfort. Remember his, one, his father said, Noah's going to come, he'll be a great comfort to us. It's kind of a vague prophecy. And the promise that Noah and his wife and sons together with all creatures with him would be safe from the flood. This, now, brethren, this is what they had to work with. Yeah. This is what they had to work with. You say, what does that prove? It proves God doesn't have to have you have a lot of knowledge for him to do to fulfill his purpose. Yeah, right. He can do his work, carry it right on, even though there's a sparse amount of knowledge here. Mm -hmm. The benefit of the purpose, receiving the benefit of the purpose, that's what requires yeah, the knowledge. The barrenness of Sarah's and other things. See, there, everything's working against it. If you just look, if you just read Genesis, the first 11 chapters, everything's working against God actually doing anything. And so some people think he didn't. He scrapped the plan. Then he scrapped it again when Israel fell. And if that's the case, then we don't know that he's not going to scrap the one he's got now. Thank God that's not the case. So these, as I say, these few things that I've listed were the totality of the good things God had revealed to these people. Which teaches you that for God to show you things, you've got to have kind of a wider base of knowledge for God to show something new to you. He's not going to show new things, new about redemption and the glory of salvation by grace to someone and all they know is Jesus is the Son of God. That's all they know. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. You've got to come up in your level of understanding before God can show you these things. Why? Because they're interrelated with all these other workers. You've got to know what God's done up to the point you're, you're seen. You've got to know what something of what God's done because it's all integrated together. There was no revelation of what the seed of woman would do for humanity. Up to up, we're talking about up to the conclusion of chapter eleven. We know a seed was going to come to do something to Satan, but that we don't know anything he's going to do to man or for man or with man or to man. None of that's been revealed. The next chapter is going to start going to start opening it up. Of course, <laughs> that's quite a thing to consider to me. At every point, we would see that the world is now ready 
for these thoughts to be developed. Yeah. And now, now that uh, there's been some idea about what, how God feels about sin, been some idea about how God feels about those who walk with him, see, some idea how God feels about men planning grandiose plans without him in mind, we've got kind of picked up on, now we're ready to, God to talk about what he's doing, what he's going to do. And we hope by this time, their people's appetites have been whetted, whetted, whetted for what God's going to do. And then when they hear it, they'll, yeah. they'll fasten on it because if you've read all this about God's choices and God's workings and God's overthrow and God implementing his purpose. So when he talks about salvation, you should immediately think of him carrying it out to his fruition, making you stand. All this should make sense, see, mm-hmm. to the person who's picked up on all these things. Well, I think I'll uh, I'll close there. There certainly is a lot in that. And this was uh, this was the most difficult part to <laughs> to teach. There'll be some more genealogies in that, but it'll mean a lot more to you now that this yeah, you see this. Yes, Sister Barb. So because in, in studying this, that there is a connection between each generation following it to the culmination, mm-hmm. that shows that the, that the Lord is working and there's not a generation that is lost mm-hmm. in the progress to the culmination. Amen. Mm-hmm. Others tonight? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that uh, has been impressing me more and more is how today people are being taught that how it's everything's all about the individual. That God He yeah. just loves everyone so much. It's a, it, you're just so special. But here we see. I mean, it, it's, to me, it's pretty clear that it's all about God and what He's doing, showing Himself and making revealing uh, how He is and how He works. And that the person isn't the, the main thing, that people aren't as special as people say they are. But this takes so much pressure off of the individual. When you're putting your focus on God and looking at Him and what He's doing, mm-hmm. I'm thankful to see that. I remember, I, I think it was you, the first one that kind of opened my eyes to that. And then you see, you know, of course, when you read the Bible, God talks about, I did this, and I, I chose mm-hmm. you, and I... And all through it, I told God's all focusing on him. The focus is on the individual. But um, it really does take a lot of pressure off the person to live towards God and not for self. Amen. Amen. Yes, to Nikki. Um, how you brought out that salvation doesn't just start for the when you come out of darkness and go into light, how it started way back here. Mm -hmm. And um, I I like how you brought that out. And it, um, I lost my thought. Hang on a second. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Sorry, I had to regain my thoughts. Um, I also like how you brought that out because um, all these things towards the end here of um, how it looked like everything was stacking up against the Lord. Mm-hmm. And um, see, he he actually sets these things up like that intentionally mm-hmm. so that he can show what salvation yes. actually Amen. is. It's Amen. Like, how would we know what salvation <laughs> is if there was nothing to be saved from? That's yeah, good. Um, I was thinking about this um Actually, just this last week, I was thinking again about this tornado. When we moved here, the Lord could have kept us from buying the house we bought. He could have, you know, had us go somewhere else. And he knew that it, six and a half years ago, before we moved here, that this was going to occur. But um, he worked that out for us um, and a lot of the other brethren here, too. And so you can see that the Lord... Um, he sets these things up so you can see how he is saving. Yes. Amen. Amen. 
Yes, yeah, I appreciate the, the way that you labored through this um, this matter of election or predestination and the way that it, you presented it with uh, the obvious choices. I mean, you can't, you couldn't really hardly read the text and not come to the conclusion that God chose these certain men yeah. and didn't choose hundreds of others <laughs> for the same the, at the same time period. Yeah. And so it just, you know, they kind of when people balk against predestination or election. They really, I think it's a reaction or something that somebody has taught them. I don't know that you'd ever get from the scripture. Just read the Bible with it, with, and, and come come up with the conclusion that it's wrong or there, there, there's something wrong in that. Yeah. It's had some some outside influence has come in and and yep. denigrated it somehow, and 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 made men think that that they're of a greater worth than or their choice is greater than God's choice. Yeah. Because uh, you wouldn't never get that from the scripture. You would never get it from an apostle. Yeah. And and, and it, obviously you couldn't read the book of Romans and come to the conclusion. That's right. <laughs> so I mean, it just it just it's, it, how would a doctrine like that get started? Well, we know Satan is the father of the lie. Yeah. But um, what, the, when you see it clearly, when you see it from the perspective that you presented it tonight, see it's just so obvious, and and it's something to glory in. It's not something to, to balk against. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Praise Amen. God. Yeah, things like this enter when men sleep. Yeah, that's right. Uh -huh. They fall asleep. That's okay. when it enters. Amen. It's very clear that he's the one that begins the work. That's right. And he's the one that finishes it. Amen. 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 All right, we'll have a word of prayer.